Hi guys, welcome to this video looking at how you can work out the type of bonding present for any substance that you could be given in the GCSE exam. And then once you've worked that out, explaining the properties of them. So for example, you could be given lots of different chemicals in your GCSE exam. It could be FeCl3, iron chloride, NaCl, sodium chloride, CO2, carbon dioxide, graphite, diamond, or just Fe, iron. And you could be asked to explain the properties of them. So before we do that, you need to work out what type of bonding is occurring. To work that out, you need to know whether you have metals or non-metals or both. Now remember, everything to the left of the periodic table is a metal, so the left of my zigzag here. Everything to the right is a non-metal, with the exception of hydrogen up here, which is also a non-metal. Now for something to be ionic, it must contain metals and non-metals. If it doesn't contain both of them, it's not ionic. For it to be covalent, it should only have non-metals, that's for both simple and giant covalent. And for it to be metallic, it should have only metals. So if we go back to those examples, iron chloride, iron is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, therefore it is ionic. Sodium chloride, sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, therefore again it's ionic. Carbon dioxide, I've got carbon, which is a non-metal, I've got oxygen, which is a non-metal, therefore I have covalent. But is it simple or giant? The way to work out whether it's simple or giant covalent is to follow this simple rule. Does it have very few atoms involved, CO2, H2O? Then yes, it's simple. If not, if it's got loads and loads of different atoms, so many atoms makes it giant covalent. So for example, diamond, graphite, they have thousands of carbon atoms, nanotubes, graphene. These are the four key ones that you need to learn for your GCSE. So if we go back to CO2, I've got three atoms, it's simple covalent. Graphite is only made up of carbon, so it's covalent, but it's made up of thousands of atoms of carbon all joined together, so it's giant covalent. And the same with diamond. Iron is a metal, there's only iron there, therefore it is metallic bonding. And that's how you work out what type of bonding is going on. We now need to move on to what are the properties of all these chemicals. So if we look at the properties then, and start off with ionic, which was our iron chloride and sodium chloride, we can say that sodium chloride has a high melting point. We can say that it doesn't conduct electricity as a solid. We can also say it does conduct as a liquid. If we move on to simple covalent, carbon dioxide, water, we can say they have low melting points. We can say they don't conduct at all, either as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. If we move on to giant covalent, all of them have high melting points. So diamond, graphite, all have high melting points and most of them don't conduct electricity. There are the exceptions that you will have come across, which are graphite, graphene, and your nanotubes. So they do conduct electricity, and we'll get onto that later in the video. And then finally, metals. All metals, regardless of what we're talking about, have high melting points. They all conduct electricity, and they are malleable, which means they can be hammered into shape. So the question is, why? Now we know what the properties are, in an exam you could be asked to explain the properties. Let's start off with why ionic compounds have high melting points. So we have our anions and cations, which are our positive and negative ions. They're surrounding each other and they form an ionic lattice. Now the thing that gives ionic compounds a high melting point is our strong electrostatic attraction between those cations and anions. That's going to get you two marks in an exam. The third and final mark is for turning around and saying that lots of energy is needed to break those bonds, to break that strong electrostatic attraction. Therefore, they have a high melting point. So why don't they conduct as a solid? Again, it's all to do with that strong electrostatic attraction between the cations and anions. If that strong electrostatic attraction is there, the ions are not free to move. They're held in place in that lattice. If they can't move, they can't carry a charge but they can conduct as a liquid. So what happens when it becomes molten, when it becomes dissolved, that allows them to conduct electricity? And hopefully, from the definition we've just talked about, you can figure it out. Those ions are now free to move. So when it's a liquid, the ions are free to move, and therefore it can carry a charge. And that's it for ionic bonding. Let's have a look at simple covalent. So we had our carbon dioxide, our water. They have low melting points. They don't conduct electricity at all. So we'll start off with they don't conduct electricity. 
Why is that? Let's have a look. We have pairs of electrons and we have shared pairs of electrons. There are no spare electrons there, no delocalized electrons. There's no charged particles that can move. So there's nothing to carry a charge. So you get one mark for saying there are no spare or delocalized electrons and one mark for saying nothing can carry a charge. If we move on to why they have low melting points and boiling points then, nice and simply, every covalent compound has a shared pair of electrons. Every single covalent compound, every single covalent bond is strong. So the key thing to remember here is we are not breaking those bonds. Any time that you mention that those bonds are broken, you will lose all marks. So never mention covalent bonds being broken for simple covalent. What we are breaking is these weak intermolecular forces, the weak forces between the molecules. They're really easy to break, so not much energy is needed to break them. So you get one mark for saying weak intermolecular forces between the molecules, and one mark for saying not much energy is needed to break these weak forces. On to giant covalent. High melting points, we'll start off with that. So every single one of them has a high melting point. This time, there are no intermolecular forces. All we have is lots of strong covalent bonds. So if we want to break them, if we want to melt them, we have to break those strong covalent bonds. Therefore, lots of energy is needed to break those strong covalent bonds. Now, why don't most giant covalent compounds conduct exactly the same as simple covalent? We've got pairs of electrons. There are no spare or delocalized electrons. Therefore, nothing to carry or pass on the charge. Now, there are exceptions which we talked about, which are graphite, graphene, and your nanotubes. Why can they conduct each of these only has three strong covalent bonds. Diamond made four. Therefore, there is a spare delocalized electron. Because that's delocalized, it can carry or pass on a charge, so it can conduct electricity. Now, these three are the ones to remember. There are others, but you don't need to know that for your GCSE exam. There is one final bonus property I want to talk about in giant covalent, and that is why graphite can be used as a lubricant. And the reason for that is that there are weak intermolecular forces between the layers, and those layers can slide past each other, which reduces friction. On to the final type of bonding, which is metallic. We're going to start off with the structure of a metal. So you have your nucleus, which is made up of protons and neutrons, which is positive, very similar to a cation and you have your electrons. Now in a metal, those electrons are free to move. If they're free to move, we say they are delocalized. So when you look at your metal structure, it is a sea of delocalized electrons. So a sea of electrons that are free to move. And your definition of a metallic bond is cations surrounded by that sea of delocalized electrons. So how does this help to explain the high melting point? Again, similar to ionic bonding, those delocalized electrons are negative, your cations are positive, there are strong electrostatic attractions. So your definition for a metallic bond is a strong electrostatic attraction between your cation and your delocalized electron, and lots of energy is needed to break those bonds. Why do metals conduct electricity? Nice and simply, they can conduct because those delocalized electrons can flow, they're free to move. And then our final property, why are they malleable? Why can they be hammered into shape? Again, it's all down to that metallic structure. So we have our delocalized electrons, which are attracted to our positive cations by that strong electrostatic attraction. If you were to hammer on a metal, what happens is the layers can slide past each other, but it doesn't break that strong electrostatic attraction because the electrons are moving with it. So the layers can slide past each other, and it doesn't break that strong electrostatic attraction between your cation and your delocalized electrons, or between your metallic bonds. Right, the final part of this video, we're gonna bring it all together. So I've got four chemicals here for you, and we're gonna start off with NiBr2. Hopefully you can see we have a metal and a non-metal, therefore we know straight away it's ionic. This tells me we have a high melting point. Therefore, I can explain that lots of energy is needed to break the strong electrostatic attraction between my ions. 
We also should be able to remember that because it's ionic, it doesn't conduct as a solid. Why? Because the ions are not free to move. But it can conduct as a liquid. So when molten, why? Because the ions are now free to move. So I've been able to pick that out just by looking at the chemical formula. If I move on to NH3, N is a non-metal, H is a non-metal, so it's covalent. I've only got four atoms involved, so it's simple covalent. So straight away, I know I have a low melting point. Why? Not much energy is needed to break the weak intermolecular forces. I also know it doesn't conduct because there are no spare or delocalized electrons, so I can't pass on a charge. Let's move on to diamond. Diamond, hopefully you remember, is made up of many carbons, so it's covalent, and because it's many, it's giant. Therefore, it has a high melting point. Why does it have a high melting point? Again, lots of energy is needed to break, and in this case, it's our strong covalent bonds. And then diamond, like most giant covalent compounds, doesn't conduct. Again, why? Because there are no spare or delocalized electrons to pass on a charge. And then finally, if we move on to zinc, Zinc is a metal, so it's metallic bonding, therefore it conducts. Why? Because we have delocalized electrons, they can flow. It has a high melting point. Why? Because lots of energy is needed to break the strong electrostatic attraction between our cation and delocalized electron. And then finally, we can say it's malleable. Why? Because those layers can slide past each other without breaking the metallic bond. And that really is everything that you need to know for this video. Okay, let's have a look at some of the questions the examiners can ask you. So I've got four chemicals we're going to talk about. Water, H2O, magnesium hydroxide, MgOH2, aluminium, Al, and graphene, C. Question one, identify the type of bonding in each chemical on the right. So look at water. It's got hydrogen and oxygen, both non-metals. What type of bonding is that? Magnesium hydroxide, Mg, it's a metal. Oxygen and hydrogen, non-metals. What type of bonding is that? Aluminium, just Al. That's a metal, so what type of bonding is that? And graphene, made up of many, many carbon atoms, what type of bonding is that? So one mark for each. Number two, explain the ability of MgOH2 to conduct electricity. So now you know the type of bonding, explain why it can or can't conduct. Question three, explain why aluminium is malleable. So you should know what type of bonding that is, and therefore talk to me about why it is malleable, why it can be hammered into shape. Question four, explain why graphene can conduct electricity. So you've got to know the structure of graphene, you've got to know the type of bonding. Once you do that, it's fairly straightforward. Then finally, explain the melting point of water, H2O. So what type of bonding is it? Therefore, what's the melting point, high or low, and why? Pause the video, have a go, and we'll see how you've done in a minute. Okay, let's go through question one. Identify the type of bonding in each of the types of chemicals on the right. So if we start off with water, H2O, as I've said, we've only got non-metals. If it's non-metals, it's covalent. However, there's only three atoms involved, therefore it's simple covalent. One mark for that. MgOH2, we've got a metal, we've got a non-metal. Straight away we go to ionic, we don't need to do anything more on that one. The third one, aluminium, it's just a metal, therefore it's metallic fairly straightforward. And then finally, graphene is made up of carbon. Carbon is a non-metal, therefore it's covalent. You just have to remember, graphene is one of the ones that's made up of thousands of carbon atoms, therefore it's giant covalent. So one mark for that one, four in total. Question two, explain the ability of magnesium hydroxide to conduct electricity. So first of all, we now know it's ionic, therefore you need to be able to tell me that ionic compounds can't conduct when solid, but can conduct when liquid. Then you need to explain why. So when a solid, it's because the ions can't move because of that strong electrostatic attraction. And when liquid, the ions become free to move and can pass on a charge. Question three, explain why aluminium is malleable. So straight away, that should tell you it's metallic bonding because only metals are malleable. Therefore, it's about the layers being able to slide past each other for one mark. And why? Because it doesn't break either the strong electrostatic attraction between your cation and delocalized electron or it doesn't break the metallic bond. Either of those gets you the second mark. 
Fourth question, explain why graphene can conduct electricity. So hopefully you've picked up its giant covalent. The only reason that the giant covalent compounds can conduct electricity is because there are three strong covalent bonds between our carbon atoms. That means we have a delocalized electron. That means those electrons are free to move or flow. So any two of those three marks are gonna get you two out of two. And finally, explain the melting point of H2O. So straight away, we've talked about there's only three atoms involved, it's only non-metal, so we know it's simple covalent. Therefore, the only one that has a low melting point is our simple covalent, one mark for that. Then it's talking about why, so we've got weak intermolecular forces and not much energy is needed to break those forces. Remember, any reference to breaking bonds, any reference to anything to do with bonds in that question could result in you getting zero. So be careful, it's the intermolecular forces being broken. And that really is it for this video. I have got a review question for you. If you want to have a go at it, leave it in the comments. I can tell you if you're right or not. First question, we've got four more chemicals. What's the type of bonding in each? Second one, explain the ability of methane to conduct electricity. Can it, yes or no, and why? And then questions three, four, and five are all about melting points. Three, why does copper have a high melting point? Four, why does graphene have a high melting point? And five, why does potassium bromide have a high melting point? And that really is everything to it. Thanks for watching. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.